Okay, so I'm going to talk some more, a little bit more about this uh, random walk stuff because we, right, that's that's the start of these number of mechanisms that give rise to power law. Size distributions, which are everywhere and which matter terribly. And of course, I'm only going to be able to really give you a few examples. And, and what I want you to sort of emerge from this course with is uh, that there are these big patterns in the in the universe, basically, and, the, and especially in the this little ball thing we live on that uh, recur, but the mechanisms for getting to them, you know, are varied and how you might deal with that, how you might try to, you know, thwart it if it's a dangerous thing, how you might want to work with it if it's a good thing, you know, that, that all matters as to how it's coming about, right? So tax the rich is what I'm saying, basically, right? Um, <clears throat> sorry, shouldn't say those things. Um, let's see, they're watching. Um, okay, so, I had a few little things. Uh, I had a bit of a festival yesterday of, well, every day is a festival, but it was making, uh, where am I? Over here. Making uh, making some more figures, but I wanted to show you an older older one. Uh, let's see, so this is just a little warm-up thing. So this is from some some time ago. It's a, it's a um, let me get it like this. I guess what I wanna do is go backwards. It's not. So sometimes I, if if you've you've found my ridiculous scripts, right? I mean they yeah you know, they do things they're powerful things, and I'll show you a little bit more about making figures because I realize you've been suffering with this. Uh, but it is a it is a craft. It really is a craft. It's an art thing. I'm not saying that mine is, but you know it is, and it's a very it's a thing to struggle with over and over. If you're trying to we're trying to tell stories, right? Again, not necessarily successful. But this is this is a figure, and what happens is every time I make it, I, I write to a log, and sometimes I have a switch which will record the output, right, in a PDF, and then they all they're all um, have a timestamp. And then you can make a little thing. So this is the evolution of a particular thing. This is chaotic contagion on networks. And it's just, you can sort of, there's just, boop, 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 it's sort of marking things out. There are placeholders. It gets, now it's getting tuned up a little bit, putting in something, getting the right writing. Boom, 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 labels. And then there's going to be a little line to make it. There's a red line because that means something. Messing around with color maps, there'll be, yeah, like that's a bit, that doesn't work out. And that's sort of a final product there. And then this one, similar one. So just a complete mess to start with, right? You just throw it up on the board and then start to kind of push things around. If you've seen, so now, you know, completely transforms at this point. I knew I was trying to get that in there. Um, this is These are big figures, so it's a bit, Right, right. For all of this? Yeah, no, I do use MATLAB for everything. Yeah. Um, and you guys shouldn't do that. <laughs> but it, it remains that it's, you know, it is, it is extremely powerful. And, um, and I don't want you to, you know, I've, obviously this script exists in MATLAB because I had to make it. And because making it was the whole creation of the whole thing, right? So... There's a lot of figuring out going along. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm just making a figure. Now we can do that, right, in other things. But I need uh, willing volunteers. So this gets more and more elaborate and ridiculous. And maybe you don't need to see all that. But um, let's see, it was a continuous. And eventually, well, I guess that's it. Eventually ends up with that, that figure. This is really strange behavior on, on uh, contagion dynamics on networks for fads. So sometimes I record it. It's nice to go back and see the the madness. But I also have this recording. Let me see if I can make this. Every time it, I make a figure, and I've done this for maybe 10 years now, I realize. Uh, so this, this little command here, this is a word count, right? So this is going to this log. So you see there's a log. I have this work log figures thing. And every month, it just every time I make a figure, it writes to this log. It says what it is. You know, like, here's the little last one. This is from yesterday, right? It says what the figure is, the directory, how big it is, the timestamp, that sort of thing. And you can see I'm iterating, iterating, iterating over these things. And that's the point of this, right? So there's like 10,000 back here in 2019. Let me, let me get the right thing again. This is a basically a history of madness. 17,000 iterations here back in March when I was, and I mean, that work is about to come out. That's really gigantic. It's the most... I mean, 
most exciting thing I've worked on my life, I suppose. And then, you know, back here, this is total insanity. It's 30,000. I think this is, yeah, well. Is that 30,000 times the Yes, so it's everything, right? So, so you can go through then and do a diagnostic of which figures got tweaked and then new ones, right? How many, how many, so it's exactly this thing again, right? How many unique ones there are and how many tokens. So sometimes, right, you make a figure and eventually you're like, oh, I'm going to do 10,000 of them now. So it's that, right? Sometimes, but you don't want to be like, that's not what you iterate on, right? You iterate on that, that core one, and then you can amplify it. So, and I'll, I'll just show you two more and then I'll, I'll stop this. And I know there's a, another question. So these are a couple of examples. So the Allotax one has that name, but before he came up with that name, I sort of had zip shuffling as the word and shuffling is not right, right? That's like deck shuffling and that's not what's happening. It's a turbulent story. Hey, you all moved away. Huh. Okay. So, um, and this is, uh, then we, you know, we've got to make up a word, so allotaxonometry. And then this is usiometry, which is the measurement of essence of something. So this is going to be essence of meaning. And so this one has been a bit of a bonanza. There's like 11,000 of those. So anyway, usiometry. It's very nice. Um, power and danger. That's the, that's the, that's the, yeah, right. Well, we might, that's definitely in this course. It's in the, it's in the next semester. So yeah, so you'll find out how to become famous at some point, right? Um, also what the meaning of everything is. So, you know, I think that's interesting. Um, I don't want to sell it too much. Okay, so uh, there's that, and there was a question. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, so depends which field you're from. Right? Some fields, no figures, right? There are no figures. I'm like, where are the figures? This is sad. There's not even a table. Like, what's going on? Tables are usually the worst, right? With a bunch of asterisks or something. And you're like, what are you doing? You could make this, you know, like, please. God, this is painful. Um, even even just tables where you just put bars behind them. And that's exactly what these allotax things do, right? That's that's at least an elevation, I think. Because this could be just, a, this could be a table with numbers. And so you still have the table, you still have the list and you have the numbers, but you have a little bar underneath it. And then, and this took me 10 years to figure out. Anyway. Um, because I would have the, you know, the, the name out here and the bar here and try to fit it together. But, you know, it turns out you can, yeah, some shading. I mean, all these things had to come along like, um, alpha, you know, and all that sort of nice stuff. So you could kind of fade things. Okay. But and so let me just quickly, so I, it'd be nice. And I did do this last semester where we read a paper and we're going to try to do this. We have this, um, thing called the paper shredder, right? Which, um, is a, we, we, we have to revive it, but it's something we run now and then. It's kind of the classic, um, you know, um, let's see. Where is it underneath? It should be under here, yes. Right, I'll read this out. Every two or three or four weeks, and sometimes we miss semesters, and in the grand tradition of courageous academics everywhere, we review the painstaking, meticulous work of others not present to defend themselves. Pure of motivation, we endeavor to instantly and yet casually see where the paper obviously goes wrong and how work we did 15 years ago contains. The entire paper's thesis is a footnote on page 17. Finally, based on a loud list of ritualistic chant, uh, we measure, we decide whether the paper lives to be read again um, or dies by shredding. Cited never more, and we did shred, we did shred some. <laughs> We, we re refrain from tweeting it. Um, but, you know, that was kind of fun. I think there was some shock in, in, in some of our members. Anyway, uh, but this is a parody of how people behave, right? This is not, right? Which, even so, that's an obvious parody. You still had people in the room. It's like, why are you, why would you write? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I lost my ears. Um, <clears throat> too much excitement. Uh, it's because uh, this is the way... This is the way you, uh, you, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but reading papers, yeah, you go for the title. What's the title tell you, obviously, and then you skim the abstract and the straight to figures, straight to figures, right? And, and the world, it depends again on the field, but, you know, say some words, the, the captions have everything. They shouldn't be just like, this is a picture of an elephant, see, you know, whatever, um, you know, because it's hard to swarm back into the paper, right? So it's a difficult business. And in some ways, I want to have a paper eventually that says C figures. That's title, abstract, and then C figures one through seven is the first one. Um, but you can definitely do it. So there's a Dr. Seuss approach, which is you draw all the figures and make all the figures first, and then you tell a story through it, which is what I understand 
he apparently did, which was just sometimes, right? Lots of figures, drawings, and then would you know, tie them together. I know they, they do this for writing too, like uh, The Office the, is an example. So they put yellow post-its everywhere all over the wall of, you know, Dwight and something, right? Just ideas everywhere. And we kind of have this for research. We have a million ideas. And then you just go, hmm, let's, let's make this stuff. So, um, yeah, and, you know, figure, if figure one is a disaster and figure, you know, you, you're out. You know, you don't have so much time. You can't, you can't do this. And then eventually you may read it, from, but no one reads papers, I don't think, linearly. I mean, you could, but you only do that eventually. Even so, we spend a lot of time trying to make it so that if you read it linearly, it's fine, right? But we kind of understand people will go to the front, the end, what's the conclusion, back to some figure one, run around in some other figures. Yeah, madness. Now, the, so the figures, but again, depends on your field. I mean, I think figures are, yes. Sorry. Okay. No, no, don't worry about that. Yeah. You should, if you, please just refresh the most recent version. If I have problems like that, um, let, let me know and let Michael know. Draft. Yeah. That will pop in. Good question. All right. I don't look at this too much, but it's kind of a strange uh, thing that I've had um, sitting there for a long time and 10 years, I suppose. All right. I have lots of things. So, so, but our new idea, just to connect back, is is instead what we'll do is we're, we're building a hopper for this thing, and then we'll just like meet, and then pull out a random paper, and then read it for like ten seconds or a minute or maybe the whole time, depending on how it's going, right? Yeah, but it's going to be like, and then no or yes. So no preparation. I'm attached to the table. Um, wow, there's so many. Sh I mean, it's me, obviously, but they're amazingly sharp. They're trying to eliminate us, obviously. <laughs> it's a cost-saving measure. Just build it into the infrastructure. Oh, another professor died this week. Um, I mean, look at this one over here. Clearly a trap. Very smart. <laughs> See, I said it was like the squid game, right? It, it is. Yeah. Um, good God. Uh, uh, what was the question? <laughs> yeah. um, no, no, please remind me. I've lost myself. What are, oh, yeah, terrible title, obnoxious content. You know, like we've solved everything. It's just like I hate you. Or like we know this person's terrible. Or like someone says, you know, they always lie about everything. You know. It's really disappointing. Like the, tr the great tragedy for me in science is coming up from absolute naivety and then realizing there are humans in it. And they seek fame. They, they do all these other things. There are great scientists who are pure scientists. I mean, the largest, yeah, and you know, there are, right? And it's wonderful. But there are all these other people who are not here for the right reason. Yeah. I mean, it's not a good place to make money. So I'm not sure what's going on. Um, you've made a terrible mistake, basically, if you're in here for the... Anyway, um, yeah, yeah, you know, and then, you, I mean, I don't, you know, there's an article about Pinker the other day in The Guardian, I don't know if anyone saw any of this, but Stephen Pinker, who's, you know, one of these celebrity characters, and, you know, there's this bit towards the end, which describes walking into his apartment, full of paintings and pictures of him, <laughs> pretty big ones, and it's, and the issue, I guess, is, oh, people just send, he says, people send you things, and it's hard to throw them away, anyway. I mean, I, you know, and I know, you know, I have old colleagues who, who, you know, would sort of talk about Nobel Prizes and things like that. And, and, you know, some people, of course, that's, that's the goal, right? They're really going for it. There are people who've gotten into a lot of trouble for cheating, manufacturing papers after paper, because they, they know what it should be, basically, and they're trying to get to a Nobel Prize. You can get to the Ig Nobel as well. That's probably where we're going to get to. But, you know, one of them, I remember talking about that with someone and, and seeing how this person's always trying to get in and, you know, people are nominating them or whatever. And, and then the, the, the comeback from this person was, no, you want to be in a movie, right? You want, that's what you want. You want real, and it was very genuine and serious. And I'm like, oof, you know, like, anyway. So I, I'm pretty dogmatic about it. don't name things after people, you know, like ideas, 
matter. Obviously, they can undo everything as well. But, um, you know, we, we, we've definitely got into this big fame period for, um, for science, I think. Not that it was great in the past. It was, it was the fame was a bit different. It was like, you know, the, it was the great man theory, right? And people totally roll in on this. Like, you know, I mean, just naively, it's just like there'll be a professor, 35 people working on the paper, just their one name at the top. Did really crucial things. So, we're, you know, we're much more inclusive, although that is not universal at this point in time. Okay, so um, I'm happy to talk about these things. So let's see. I am going to – if this is working still. <laughs> if they were what? If they were – I think Russia might have had that for a while, because I think the, and they walk around with a couple of nuclear physicists. Um, sort of an Asimov type approach to the world. I don't, um, no, I don't know. I think it's, I think it, the, so what I've noticed over the years, the resting state for Twitter, when nothing bad is happening, is sports, music, movies, just, you know, writ large, right? So that's okay. That's okay. When I was doing this work yesterday, I listened, I will admit this constantly, I just go to Twice, right? The K-pop band. I just, because they pop up in my Twitter thing and in my analysis, not in my feed. And I've listened to BTS and these things. And it's, it is basically mainlining joy. That's pretty good. I don't think you get that from professors. You know. Should they be? No, I don't think so. Because what happens is people will just do bad things. And we'll get to this later on the course, right? How do you become famous? Well, there is organic ways of becoming famous, but of course, as soon as you start to see that mechanic, you goose it. There are lots of ways to, to goose it. And we've done it forever and we'll continue. Wow. Are there like bear traps under here or something? Wow. Unbelievable. It's just rain, isn't it? Okay. All right. The UVM is not. Are you serious? Infrastructure. Uh, I guess we can. Um, is there an open window that we can? I'm just suggesting that it's an out of the box idea. <laughs> no, no, you don't. It's all right. No, I, screw it. Okay, let's 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 talk about. I'm going to finish this. We're going to talk about the um, what happens. Uh, a little bit more about this random. Um, Boundary behavior and then uh, random walks and random boundaries and those sorts of things. Something to do with life and death will, will pop up in here very quickly. Uh, then we'll talk about um, the most benign thing, which is just variable transformation being a source of uh, power law size distributions. And we have a nice example there is what happens if you are randomly relocated to any point in the universe, right? Which is like from a 1912 paper or something ridiculous. Thing. I don't know what they were thinking about, but it was well before Doctor Who. Okay, so these, what I what I sort of showed you is these connections between exponents, and there was this little derivation where we said, okay, we've got. Um, I know this is a lot. I, I'm just going to tell you, but we've got base and length. So if you randomly go to a point on a, you know, like the Amazon or um, you know, say the Mississippi Basin for the U.S. right, the Nile. So you just randomly go to a point on the map, and if you're in a river stream, you can say, well, what's the longest stream going up from there, and what's the basin area, which you know matters tremendously in terms of how the system functions, right? Because water is this is a huge part of our existence. We live in this sort of rugged 2D landscape, and water is a big, big part of that. Okay, so so how it all fits together matters. Uh, so we had this L to the minus three halves, which is a very dangerous kind of situation, right? The exponents between one and two. So that's, you know, things we expect very large things when we sample from this. And we did this little transformation of variables business and got to um, A to the minus four thirds for, the, for area, right? So base and area. And then we'll say this is A to the minus tau. So uh, the connection in here was that, that the basins in these random walk ones have some length and then they have these boundaries and the typical width of them comes from the standard deviation thing that we saw early on with random walks, which is L to the half. So that's important. So there's a more general story here for river networks that people have gone out and measured, you know, 
initially actually from surveying, right? Standing there and kind of walking around on rivers and, and trying to estimate this physically, again, with many graduate students who are not acknowledged. Um, it's like Hack's paper in 1957. It's just JT Hack. But, you know, and of course, as you read it, you think, oh, they did this. But now, you know, over time, it's become clear. And in some cases, it's become reported well, like how many people are actually involved, who did the real work, um, which sometimes is like the math. Sometimes it's the, right? Anyway. Okay. We know these terrible things, but I will hop on it. Uh, so... This, these exponents for area and length, they're a bit different. So the area one is between 1.3 and 1.5. And again, this is, you know, one is the cutoff, right? That's the smallest it can be. These are extreme exponents. And then there's this general relation. This is Hack I mentioned. There's this famous paper by Hack, who noticed that the length scales as area to the edge. And very early on in the course, we talked about scaling. Um, the basic kind of scaling you'd expect for this would be a half, right? Because A to the half... This is, a, this is the Buckingham Pi theorem in its simplest way, right? There's a length, and this is length squared. So to get the right units, you'd expect that. So um, with a very small amount of data, did not observe that. Um, uh, Hack found something like 0.6, you know, and, and sort of 0.57, I think, right? Something like that. So then eventually physicists appear and say, oh, that is 5 eighths. I can find that, you know, like they have a, they have, a, they have a little bit of a plan, and um, you know, it's sort of part of that, right? You're looking for this magical truth, but in fact, for large networks, it turns out as a paper towards the end of the '90s, it said actually, kind of the big, the big outer basins, right? They basically look like isometric scaling. So it is what you should think, but it seems maybe there's some allometric scaling for smaller ones in in, in certain places, right? They they tend to be they become thinner as 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 you get to larger and larger basins, which is what that means. Okay, there are certainly models that exist with interesting values of H and they all kind of fit together, right? So, and, and I'll just show you this quickly. We'll just redo this calculation with the exponent for length, area, and the way area and length are related to each other. So it's exactly the same calculation from a few slides ago. So length is scaling is some area to the H, right? If you look across basins, these are the two scaling laws for probability of area and length. Again, we're just going somewhere on a, on a landscape and measuring area and length. So we do this, and so you'll do this. This is an important thing. We're going to do it a few times, but this is the basic transformation of variables for probability distribution. So DL, we need to get our DLs and our DAs connected. So DL is just D of A to the H, right? That's it's proportional. So it's just the differential of this. So H, A to the H minus one with a DA. So now we can replace that block with this block. And that's what we do down here. The DL gets replaced with this blob. That's just a constant. A, uh, L is scaling like A to the H, so we've put it all together, and now we've, start, now we've got something that looks like um, basin area, right? These things have to be connected like this. Just do a little bit of basic stuff. There's an A to the H times minus gamma, the H times minus gamma, A to the H minus one, put them together. So now this is now in the form A to the minus tau. So tau equals whatever this blob is here, which is one plus H gamma minus one. So this is a classic thing you see over and over again in scaling systems, uh, it's scaling relations, right? So there's simple algebraic connections. You know, it's never like one is the octane of something else. It's just plus or minus some multiples, some ratios potentially. Um, we've seen that already, of course, with um, say Zip's law exponent and, and, the, and the exponent for the power law size distributions. And you can say, all right, that's not very complicated. But you know, many, many real physical systems, of course, have these connections. So this is a nice little thing. And then it turns out there are toy models that give you different um, values of this that all fit together. The one we just had, which is random networks, is two thirds. Uh, this is a half, and this is four thirds, and they all it all fits together. That's a very particular kind of network. It can be produced from different little micro mechanisms. And that's when we'll talk about, so that's when we start to talk about this thing that I'll refer to again when I have the manifesto at some point here. And uh, we'll touch on as we go through the rest of the course as well as universality, right? So this is this notion of universality. And it's, it's a word co-opted by physicists at one point. So it can be a little dangerous because it pulls away from it's perhaps what you might think it is in a common sense way. Criticality is a bit like that too. But universality, the idea there is you have systems 
with microscopically different details, right? There are different things involved. They interact maybe in slightly different ways, but they interact in ways that are sufficiently alike in a sort of almost qualitative sense that macroscopically they look the same. So fluids are sort of a great paradigmatic example of that, right? We have water and air and blood and milk and so on, and they obey the same equations. They're obviously made out of very different things, and they have different limits in those equations, uh, but there are certain a whole range of fluids that essentially have similar macroscopic behavior in, in the thing that's being dialed as, say, viscosity. All right, so that's a micro, you know, if you looked at one of them by itself, like a water molecule, right, or something, in blood, then you'd think, you know, it's not obvious at all that when you put all these things together that they behave in similar ways. So that's, an, that's this, what we will call emergence, um, uh, you know, where the, the, the whole produces some behavior that is, um, and it, it doesn't have to be something we can calculate or compute, you know, it doesn't have to be some grand equation. It's still just that there's a macroscopic phenomenon that is different from anything you might see at the microscopic level. And then universality takes it a little bit further and says, okay, there are lots of different systems that have similar, doesn't really entirely matter about their components as long as they interact in certain ways, we'll get the same macroscopic behavior, which is really incredibly profound, right? And so for example, at the end, I will mention this, I'll just say it now because I might as well say it again. Um, so ball bearings bouncing off each other on hexagonal lattices in two dimensions, but you can arrange it so that that macroscopically looks like a fluid, which is weird, but it's also great for us because of computers, but it's something that doesn't exist at all in the real world. So you can go that far. You can say, I can make a microscopic system doesn't exist in the real world, but macroscopically behaves just like something I'm very interested in. And turns out that's something we can also work with. Okay, so all, that was a bit of a longer thing, but the point is that there are these uh, universality classes associated with this, and what they get tied to with scaling is particular values of parameters, right? So H equals two thirds is enough to pin down a universality class, broadly speaking, for these, these branching networks. And this is, this is about river networks, but it's also branching networks more generally. You know, branching networks are sitting inside you right now, right? The blood system is a fantastic branching system story, you know, from one source to many sinks. And that's, a, that's in the second half of Pox, but it's, you know, you're going from one thing in 3D to many things in 3D. Uh, here we're collecting sort of in 2D, getting to a 1D outlet. And those dimensions will matter tremendously. Uh, so this is, it turns out, this is some other work that you can figure out that actually it's not just this bigger equation. And so this is a lot of work can go into doing this in systems in general. It's like, this was important. Now we can kind of see a connection. I, can, I you know, in principle, I only need to measure these two. I should measure this as well, but you can sort of see that they're connected. Um, some other work will give you this, that in fact, tau is two minus H. So if you had two thirds, two minus two thirds is four thirds. And if you put two thirds in here, you get three halves. So this is also, this is, this is a, a bigger deal because now we can say, if we have a bit, bunch of different kind of, um, basins, we can just say, what's its hack exponent is this H value. What is this little H for this one? This little H for this one. And then if we have models, this one is in this class of universality. It produces macroscopic behavior that obey, you know, H equals two thirds or H equals one or H can't be H equals one. H equals a half, for example, is the other limit. Lots of struggling publications in science and nature and those sorts of things. Um, so again, yes, as I'm saying, simplifies the, the system, you know, really means you've, you've, you've understood something really profound about it, right? So you'll see these scaling relations appear, um, right? And then this is the story of universality. We can say, okay, now we just have these classes. There's the two thirds one, the half one, the three eighths one. The, the, the. We'll see for networks that in fact, um, that there's a whole class of them where the natural question at the start once they sort of appear is like, are, these, are there distinct universality classes, right? Because that really bottlenecks what's possible um, you know, with, with things that emerge at larger scales. And it turns out for us, a slew of them, that there's actually a parameter, right? That it's not, there isn't these sort of isolated universality classes that things end up in. There's a smooth parameter that guides them around. Okay. 
I know this a lot, and hopefully I'll just keep iterating on these things. So this is a this is a PNAS paper. My old colleague um, Josh White's. Um, well, my he's old, we're old. He's we're colleagues. Um, we did a PhD together, and um, uh, Fraser was a uh, undergrad actually, and and um, has gone on to be an academic. So this is a PNAS paper, and and it was basically a random walk kind of story again for for um, death. Right, so you start with some health thing, you're wandering around, and that's a we, we've we've tackled it here partly, right, with the first return. But what if you have an offset and you're trying to get to what's the first time you reach zero, given you started at some higher value? So that's a slightly different condition. Um, you know, and it will have some bias potentially. So that's a PNS paper. Um, basketball these. There's there's rather remarkable work for basketball that shows that it basically looks like a random walk, right? The the score differential doesn't mean that it's not fun to watch or play, but just know that you're essentially taking part in a random process. <laughs> uh, we we have some work. Uh, one of our first our first graduate from the masters in complex systems and data science, um, Dylan Kiley, who works at Zillow now in Seattle. Uh, did did some did some really fun things with us, and and one of them was Australian rules football. It's the same sort of that ticker tape thing, but this is a bit different. This is a bit different, and the reason is in part because, so like in NFL, right? If you're winning, there's even though you are giant people who are in principle, you know, doing play acting of war and killing each other, and it's okay to break everyone's legs and stuff. It's kind of really rude to score a lot of points against the other team at the end. It's like really wrong. Uh, so and. It, because it doesn't really matter in the scheme of things, and that's the reason. But in Australian rules, if you, it's how many games you've won, but the next thing is just how many points you have versus how many, right? So you always want to score as many points as you can. If you're up against a weak opponent, you just want to destroy them all day. So the, this does have these, these scoring worms that just go like this. Just one team is just racking them up, you know. You, you don't want to take that. I mean, people naturally, psychologically take the, you know, the foot off the pedal sort of thing. I guess the right, it's not, okay. But, um, so that does happen. Um, and of course the other team doesn't want to get beaten by as much, but you will see these things you will never see in other sports. But basketball definitely has this kind of um, uh, distribution. So this is, um, Right. So this is to do with what we've talked about. This is a fraction of um, time that is positive or the, uh, the last time that the walk changes sign. These are these sort of basic questions, given that it's a, some time. Um, and so you can see there's a spike when t equals zero and when t equals the end of time here that spikes up. So this looks like this kind of distribution. Because, of course, you start equal. Right. You start at an equal point. Uh, so that seems to bear up. But you do see very different things. For NFL, I think also hockey, but NFL, of course, just before like the half time and the and full time, there's a lot of gaming that gets you towards scoring right there. So it's sort of a spike with that. But basketball is fun to watch. And I do think of this in terms of stories, right? So I think basketball is great to watch. This is just my opinion. Basketball is great to watch. It's spectacular to watch. It doesn't make for great stories. Like after on, you just, after the game, you just say, you know, like there was some things that happened and they scored more, you know. Whereas football, NFL gives you, American football gives you stories, right? There's real, there's sort of chapters to what happened. Doesn't mean the game is interesting to you or should be or whatever, but it, it can be told like that. Um, test cricket actually gives you the best story. It really does. Okay. Uh, so you can have generalized fractional walks. So now instead of this sigma um, behaving like two to the half, it might be uh, uh, generalized to alpha. And what happens now, so this is what we'll just call diffusive. That's no, normal random walk. So if you're looking at this thing and you're trying to figure out, you've got a whole bunch of these walks and you're trying to figure out how far apart they um, move. I should do a better job with that. Um, right, so you could do some analysis of a real thing and find that you, you know, try to measure the exponent. And so if it's alpha is greater than a half or less than a half, you might have super diffusive, you would have super, what's called super diffusive and sub diffusive. So it's like spreading up. Right? So going towards one, right, means that the spread is wider if it's less than a half. 
it's tighter. It's not spreading as far as you might, uh, ex that you would expect from if it was just a pure random walk. And to get these two, you have to have memory in the system. We had the simplest kind of memory for random walks, which is just where are you right now? And now you have a 50-50 chance of going. But for these ones, the mechanism, there are different mechanisms, but to produce these things, you have to kind of know where you've been and they're usually integral kind of things. Which of course happens in the, right, so you need extensive memory. This is uh, one of the first papers that, and it was sort of suggested this was connected to um, contagion and how things spread, which was a bit, a bit much, but um, this is an old experiment. I don't, you know, the, I'm not sure if the web, I won't open it up, but there's a, there's this website and I'm sure none of you have seen it. So I think it's faded away, but also no one uses money. Um, you get a dollar, it was only for dollar bills and, and some people, and I know this is legal, would stamp uh, where's George on it. There's a where's, there's one for Canada as well. I think there's something similar. Okay. So there's, and there probably is in different countries. Um, anyway, but where's George in the, the monopoly paper money that the US has, which is clearly fake. But anyway, well, money's fake, so it sort of makes sense. Uh, anyway, so this was this was just sitting there as a data set, and it's Dirk Brockman and co who, who did this work. Uh, people would just go to a website if they found one of these dollars and they wanted to you know, involve themselves, they'd, they'd go to the website and they just put in the serial number and where they were, and that's it. So you have this record potentially of where a dollar bill has been. And it's sampled in this weird way, right? People don't have to do it. Um, and these are examples of, of and the, you know, they're seeded here or started in, the first recorded in Jacksonville, they went out, um, New York ones, Seattle ones, and you see this kind of movement. And so you start to think this is, this is early on, this is before, which year is this? This is really just before, I mean, Facebook exists at this point. Yeah, it was a Nature paper, 2006. So this is done in 2004 and five. It's before Facebook and all these things take off. Um, and and having you know that that amount of data that you could get at, which is still hard and difficult. But uh, people have certainly done that with cell phones. There are some a number of papers based on a massive cell phone data set, which is from Europe, and we don't know where it's from. Like that's. It's a, it a weird period in the history of science where that's all that's said. They're published in Science and Nature, and it's like, we have a data set about the people. Don't worry. And I know it was like basically someone was a fan of this professor's work because of the fame and um, turned up and said, I have a truck and I have some data. Would you like to? And actually, it's going to be a lot of trucks. Um, so a lot of people feasted on that. Um, and analyze it. I think you can back out where it is because there's enough data points and you like, I don't know where it is, but it's somewhere in Europe, some parts of Europe. You know, it's a carrier in Europe, I guess. Uh, you know, you can see if you've got the flat line, you can start to kind of obviously get cities. So, uh, you know, but this starts to give you a lot of movement. We did the same thing with Twitter. This is a paper from um, Morgan Frank, who's now a professor at um, UPIT was an undergrad here and did his master's and then, went, and then he went to do his PhD uh, with a colleague of ours at MIT. So, uh, but he, um, he led this work here and this was looking at uh, how people move around uh, just, just from timestamps, right? And it connected with this old sociological work or not older, but you know, this sort of notions of first, second, third, fourth places, which is the first place is usually home, second place is work. Third place might be you know, a religious place, it might be the bar, it might be a sports, you know, a sports venue, CrossFit boxes. Um, yeah, but it's usually some sort of religious thing, uh, which is CrossFit. Um, so anyway, so they, uh, you know, Starbucks had this thing early on saying, we wanna be the third place, people's third place. Um, so you can see it in, this, in, in these, these patterns that there really is this, if you, so you take someone's you know, someone's tweeting or their cell phone, where do they move? And then you rescale it and put it on and, you know, find the first and second one, turn them around, and you basically get these universal patterns of movement for people. And yeah, you know, traditionally people go from home to work, whoop, 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 and then there's a couple other places they go to, like, we're, and from a, another bad point of view, and there's another nature paper, it's like, we're very predictable generally. As a whole, 
where we go, you kind of know where people will be, which is great. Um, you know, like Friday night, less predictable. Fair enough, right? But it was a kind of putting a number on that, like 90% of the, you know, you could probably guess where someone was 90% of the time. <clears throat> which, of course, is, you know, the province of still terrible people um, forever, basically. Uh, so anyway, uh, and so I'm totally on board with never answering the door, which I know is your generation. So really on board with it. Never answer the phone. Okay, so. Just to get back to this, because I, I, I'm excited about it. Uh, so this is this was getting all this data. So you know, it's on this website. Just bringing it down. I think maybe 13 or 14 data points per dollar bill was about as much because they get worn out. And so you could kind of start to measure what's this kind of def like? How is this system? How are the, how are these dollar bills spreading around the world or the U.S.? Banks are involved. You know, it's it's a complicated thing. But they were able to sort of dig out that it's super diffusive in space, but sub, uh, but there are long waiting times, right? So it would really explode, right? Because people go on planes and things like that. So it's sort of, it, there's a lot of little jumps, but then boom, it would really spread. So it, it wasn't just randomly. So a normal diffusion thing, if you dropped a bunch of dollar bills here, and of course it's based on population, it would just sort of disperse out like this. Right, it would be more of a random walkie kind of thing, but it has these jumps. Of course, when networks came along, and we'll have this later on with small world networks, this, you know, we know this, but starting to quantify this became the, a big understanding of just how difficult it is to, you know, contend against the pandemic, right? And so we've known this for a long time, and we knew that you basically have to shut everything down uh, and, you know, like limit all sort of movement to prevent things from spreading, but the world is so connected that it's, um, basically impossible uh right but if you go back in time you go to other diseases you know past of course there's some you know the fastest thing might be horses or or, or you know similar kinds of you know, mule trains or something like that so there's still some sort of faster than human spread but generally they kind of went like waves across asia and europe that would spread like more of a diffusive thing yeah <clears throat> Uh, Walmart, though, I will say, Walmart was an example, and I have a video of it, yes, um, of, a, of later on, we'll see it, is a thing that spread like a like a classic old school diffusion thing, because it was based on trucking. So it started out of Arkansas and just went, and Vermont was the last one. Yes. Um, I was going to ask, is there like a more recent study like doing like kind of this same thing? Yeah, so... What's happened since then, and I just want to connect you to random walks. There's been, um, and I could point you to them. There have been other ones which are, because this was, this was about dollar bills. And then I was trying to say something about how humans move around. So it was a little, that connection was a bit harder. But then there is work on, yes, migration, people commuting, people moving within the U.S. And there are, there are a couple of different models that pop out. There is that, that, that gravity model that I pointed out, you know, like the, probability that you people would move between here and here would be divided by the length of how far away it is or sort of the time and then multiplied by their populations. That's the, would be kind of the gravity model, which is zip found all those things. So, but there's, um, there's some variations on that. That, that um, So yeah, I, yeah, 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 super interesting. I think for, for existence, right, there's hatchings, matchings, and dispatchings, right? This is the core of human existence or, or existence in general, right? And so if you had data on those things, that would be super interesting where people are born, if they couple and where they end up. So that's really, that's obscure, I realize, but it's an uncle said that to me once that it was a family gathering. And I think possibly for a funeral, but he says, this is where people, this is where people always come together, hatchings, matchings, and dispatchings. And then you think about who makes money out of those uh, those events. You're kind of vulnerable at those points. All right. But a big data set on that, you know, would obviously be kind of an interesting thing. So, okay. So we're going to, yeah, well, I mean, we, we visited these things. I don't think I had this one before, but this is the, did I? Maybe I did. Trees of unusual size. I know the Princess Bride is a long time ago and no one's ever watched it, but... Um, it's a reference machine. So now we have, instead, we have this T to the half plus an alpha. That's the, that's the piece up here. It might not be the alpha we had before, but um, 
you know, like things, there are big shocks now in this, in this system. So we're going to find other ways to get to those things. Oh my God, for the talking. This one I think is a little bit briefer. Yes, it is for sure. <laughs> what was it? What's the swamp? The fire swamp. The fire swamp. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The outlier swamp is good. I like it. <laughs> All right. Uh, I know something bad has happened here. I think I think this is this might be a. I think no, this is this is no one needs to hear that. I just need to fix this. Um, Apple, why do you do these things? Okay, all right. This is just to make sure I'm happy. Yeah. That was really hard. Yeah. All right. That's a lot. I cheated, obviously. I put two together. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, anyway, so uh, pretty good. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is the, transfig the unexpected transfiguration, right? So we go from snormals to these mountains of, of surprise. Lots of tiny little ones, unless it's that, you know, the exponent's less than two, and then they're, they're all very surprising, which means they're not surprising. They just... It's hard. It's hard to hard to walk around on this thing. Okay, and then and then really there is a power law that's you know there's a piece here which is this that there's this is there's some distribution some x value here some y value here the heights if you like and they're, and they're connected for some um, just simple inverse power law which which is sensible right there's something sensible about that we'll see this pop up again for forest fires and what's called highly optimized tolerance one of the great um, Acronyms, hot, the hot model, um, but that's a that's I think you know I really I, I think it's a really profound um, story in how these kinds of systems evolve to be in these dangerous states where really bad things can happen through natural evolutionary processes, through natural kind of engineering processes. I shouldn't say engineering is natural, but through iterative human behavior, engineering something, trying to make something work. You know. Okay, so. The idea is going to be we're going to have elementary distributions, you know, exponentials, Gaussians. For those, we have these very, very simple. Sorry, we have really solid, strong stories from the central limit theorem. Boom, right? We've got that. Exponentials come from a failure mechanism, for example. These these are things for which we have nice little stories, little mechanisms that explain them. And then we're going to have these variables connected by some power relationship, and that's going to be the the explosion. So this is going to be. I'll, I'll just talk through it. You don't have to worry too much, but uh, let's let's at least have it on the board. So we have this. We just saw it for the scaling relations for river networks. So it's the same kind of idea. We have some random variable. It's got some distribution, and then there's some connection, right? There's some relation to some other variable, right? This is a standard thing that you want to do with probability. <laughs> You know, we're not combining variables. We're just saying we have a variable here, and then we can measure this other variable here, and we know they're connected in this simple way. You know, it's, this one is three times that one. This one is, you know, the square of that one. This one is the sign, whatever it is. There's some connection. And so, in principle, you have to uh, do this ugly-looking thing here. What's the probability of y dy? Well, it's all the possible ways that we could get to y if we started x, right? Because it could be a function like this. So let me just draw a thing. Oh, I can't do it. Okay, so sim simple thing. So we have x, we have some relationship, you know, between them, and this is y. And so if we if we between if we between say x and x plus dx here, right? There's some probability distribution for this thing. Let's say this is x's probability distribution. So this is y equals some function of x. And then we're trying to figure out what's the probability distribution for y. So we go through this kind of transformation this way. And we'll have over here, we'd have this would be y, and this is b, p of y. It's, it's some functional form here. And what, the way we say it was like, well, given that x is between x and 
x plus dx, what, what's the value of y and y plus dy that that corresponds to? So it will depend on the slope, right? So the more shallow it is, the smaller a little piece, like a lot of just potentially a lot of probability gets put into a tight spot there. And of course, if it's then, if it's some function like this, then, you know, this, all these values of x, they all contribute, right? So if we're here, 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 or here, then they all add up. So that's why there's a sum, right? So you, if you if you have a, it's not monotonic, then um, you have to handle that. So that's what this madness is here. It's saying basically um, the probability of y to y. So it's, we have to find all of the x's that map to y, right? And so this is y, this is like going you know, the pre-image of it. And then this little beast here is the, it's the derivative, the, the Jacobian. It's trying to constrain how it behaves. So we'll work through an example. Um, that's, you know, the equation will work through an example. All right, so here's, we're gonna have a one-to-one -one mapping. We're gonna start with a um, simple relation. This is sort of the core thing. So it's this X to the minus alpha, right? That's, we're sort of interested in these in general. It should be a, it's a negative power. And we're thinking about uh, x being small and y being large. So, and we're not even worried about what the probability of x is or the probability of y is, you know, what, what that means for the probability of y. We're not even starting with that. We're just gonna make this little connection part. So dy equals just d whatever y is, that's this beast, right? So we've set it. So we're just doing a derivative here. So it's just x to the minus alpha minus one. Minus alpha comes down the front, we have a c. And so we can turn it around. Uh, now we have dx is this, this is just constant, right? So there's a minus c alpha here that's gonna be here. And this was x to the minus alpha minus one. So we'll, we're gonna put this on the other side. I guess we're swapping this and I'm gonna clunk all that around the other way. Or we'll put it around here and then swap. So there's an x to the alpha plus one here, but we wanna replace the dx with everything that this should all be in y, in terms of y, and we know x is the inversion of this little blob. So we'd have to, you know, y divided by c to the power of minus one over alpha. So that's x, x is y divided by c. And then um, there's a minus alpha here. That's this, this power here being removed. This is still the same at the front. So now if we have px dx, we turn it into py dy, the dx is where all the stuff happens, right? The D, dx is where all the stuff happens. And then, you know, where I'm giving you these examples, this is just a general thing. What we're, we've got y like this. So, you know, it's right, y is c x to the minus alpha. And this is obviously not right. It's, you know, like this. You know, and so everything is happening in that relationship, but that relationship can be a very reasonable, so this can be very reasonable in its provenance, right? It's something to do with dimensions, nothing nothing funny. Uh, and again, the probably for a distribution for X can be incredibly reasonable as well. Okay, so that was a bit of a big mess, but it means that we get to DX as some blob, and then there's Y minus one, minus one over alpha. I could probably write that as, uh, that's really going to be the big, the big uh, deal here. There's a one plus one over alpha, right? So this is a bit different from, it's it's less than one. Alpha is greater than zero. Words. Okay, so putting all these blobs together, this is what would happen if we have p of y and we say it's p of x dx, right? We we need this thing. We're just plugging everything in. This is p of x, this is the x value in terms of y, and this is the big dx blob. So if p of x is well behaved as y goes towards zero, or, or this quantity goes towards zero, so this is um, large y, small this, then, you know, like a Gaussian, for example, right? So as it goes towards zero, it's, it goes to a constant, there's nothing bad. So this will be pretty tame. And everything is here. Everything is from the differential going between dx and dy. Everything, get, that's where we get a tail from. 
right? So here's what I just said. So if we go to some um, non-zero constant, right, as x goes to zero, x goes to zero means this becomes, um, uh, yeah, this, this has become zero, y has become large, which means this is going to zero. Then basically, yeah, we just get that power. So it pops out that we have a power law tail. Exciting, I know that's exciting. All right. If, however, it does itself scale, right? So there's some scaling for um, x as it goes towards zero, then you have to incorporate that, right? So this is gonna go like x to the beta. So we'd have to put this, this whole blob to the power of beta. So it's really y to the minus beta over alpha. And that's what this extra piece is here. So we still get our tail part here and then we get a little extra blob on top. Depends on the function. But often it's just this. So this will pop up again later. Um, and then, you know, this is an exponential distribution, for example. So it's well behaved, obviously, as it goes towards as x goes towards zero. It's nothing special at all. It goes to, you know, right, to one over lambda here, e to the zero. Then, yeah, you get exactly this scaling. There's some corrections we don't have to worry about, but basically you get this. All right. So. And exponentials, for example, arise from randomness. Gaussian is a central limit theorem. You know, these, these are benign distributions that arise very sensibly and commonly in the real world. So we're going to have more about that you know, when we talk about robustness. That's the hot model. Um, okay, so let's just do one little example of this. So if we have uh, a random point in the universe, it's, pretty, it's a weird, strange, strange thing. Um, a strange thing to ask, I suppose. But it's, uh, you know, this is, again, this is a paper from like 1910 or 12 and thinking about um, just, just this question. Yeah, and it's to do with, you know, how is the, you know, how is space structured with, with stars? And so the observation is that it's actually this F to the minus, what's the gra you know, force of gravity you experience? It's F to the minus five halves. So this is between, well, it's 2.5, it's between two and three. So this is this very, um, dangerous region, right? So it's a, a, a finite median, but infinite variance and, and higher order moments. So most of the time things aren't too bad, but this is the one that gets you the bigger flood every 10 years, the bigger flood every 100 years, the bigger flood every 1,000 years. And, and it's definitely the statistics of surprise place. Um, all right, so let's make this little connection. So you're 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 being you're you're going everywhere in space, so that's a bit difficult. Space is kind of big, right? So we have a uniform distribution for space, but we're going to look, uh, just constrain ourselves to what happens if you, for someone who randomly appears in a ball around a star, right? Because their machine is not working properly as usual. So then, uh, the probability that they're a distance r from the star is going to grow like r squared, right? So that's the the surface area of the shell times dr. So this is a four pi r squared piece here. So, right, they're more increasingly likely to be further away. And then, yeah, this is complicated. But I mean, if we're near a star, this is this is how it's going to behave. All right. So law of gravity. Forces behaves like r to the minus two. So we have our. This is this is the inverse connection, right? This is this piece. This is the y is proportional to x to the minus alpha. And so we're gonna invert that. We'll get simply this. And then we start off with this, again, a benign distribution. All right, so if we connect the differential, so we just do the, you know, you don't have to remember the formula. We just sort of work through it. So dr, we're gonna do this d of f to the minus half. So that's, you take the derivative of this, we get a minus three halves, the minus half comes down the front, we, just a constant. So we have minus f to the minus three halves df. So we can do this game of replacing dr in here or here with f to the minus three halves df. And then the r squared we replace by this f, this f to the minus a half squared. So we'll do that. So we have these pieces, they're the connections. That's the connection between, um, right? So force of gravity going back to the radius or the distance. And um, this is the differential connection and this is the distribution we start with. So we work through it. Um, F is some constant times, sorry, R is some constant times F to the minus a half in here. There's an F to the minus three halves. We know this is behaving. 
um, like R squared. So it is one of those ones we have to take care of. This does have a beta in it. Beta is two. So we'll put that in. So it's F to the minus a half squared. That's exciting. And then it pops out as F to the minus one minus three halves, which is this. I don't know if it's observed, but it's just a you know an observation of one goofy one. So this is a goofy example. Um, but we'll, when we get to things like forest fires and all kinds of systems that that explode and and have and don't explode, right? They explode in funny ways. Like there are lots of little problems with them, and occasionally just gigantic ones. We'll we'll see this kind of story um, underlie it again as well. Okay. So as we said, it's a wild distribution. So yeah, usually it's okay to have a randomly relocating time machine, but it can be bad. Oh, that's not good. Okay, so this is a bit of a funny business, but it's not quite as bad as this. So pleplo is power law in, power law out. So that's where you ex explain this great power law of the of nature that you know, like this mystery of the world, but you've started with another one, right? This, this happens, a little shady, so you shouldn't be doing that. Um, it's again unexplained. It's okay to connect them together, it's scaling relations, that's totally fine, but sometimes it's sort of a, a shady business where you're trying to pass off a story. Uh, homunculus argument, that's true. So you know that to um, do this, or you shouldn't do this. Uh, and you, what you want is miwo, which is mild in, wild out. That's pretty good. Not always gonna be the case, but if you can you know, explain from sort of, because obviously if the you know, underneath all these things like hurricanes and virus fires and financial, they, they, there's nothing inside them necessarily that's horribly, horribly terrible that obviously says explode the world written on the outside of the atom or something. So we need mechanisms. And that is where the next part of the course goes. We start to talk about um, uh, Simon's, I'll talk about Simon's model first, which is a rich get richer model, which turns out to be the one of the most fundamental models for networks and then actually the most fundamental models in the in nature, I think, for a lot of how systems behave. Um, really profound and, and very simple in conception. Uh, and because of this course, we had a nice correction to, to that work that no one noticed, I guess, for about 50 or 60 years because I don't think anyone simulated anything. Uh, computers. Um, all right, I'm going to see if I can briefly tell you this thing. This is a manifesto. Let me see if I can do this. Uh, well, we'll see how we go. We've got 10 minutes. Usually this is at the start of the course. <laughs> but um, over time, I've buried things further in as little pieces. Okay, so there is a buggle. The buggle is not functioning today. It's not in there. But So, I, I mean, I've touched on this a bit today, universality. So it's it's not bad. So the golden age of reductionism. So we'll have this piece and then a manifesto, which basically it's a shovel means get on with it. Uh, so just, just yes, we, we should talk about it. So complex, right? It's a good. This is a good word. There have been some funny words in the in the past that people have used that I, but it seems to hold. Systems is a good word. Networks is a good word. It's very, it's very straightforward, but it's not bad. So I, I will have a thing for networks later on, I suppose. Uh, but it, yeah, made it right. It's, it's folded, right? It's folded. It comes from with folding, and that's not not too bad. Um, emergence is our other great word. There's complicated versus complex. Complicated are things that we can, you know, maybe have made entirely understand, and that's true of old mechanical watches, for example. You know, you could know it from beginning to end. It would be quite intricate. I think that time has passed. It's also passed for like cars and you know lots of other things that people could have a complete understanding of. It's certainly um, gone on now for airplanes, and we get to systemic failure type problems within an individual plane because it was made by so many people and all of the batteries explode at the same time because of some unforeseen thing. Um, I mean, it happened with ships. I think at some point in the 1600s, the English and the Dutch managed to build ships with too many cannons on them and they pushed them out and they fell over straight away because they messed up the buoyancy thing, you know, which we'd established as a, as a bit of a feature thousands of years ago. You know, you cross design boundaries, you know, bridges fall over, those sorts of things. Front falls off. Um, well, that yeah. I was gonna. I'm just. I'm trying. I, I don't want to bring this up. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, we build these. 
you know, we, we, we know how to build things. And then maybe a couple of generations of people building things, they start to like design extra pieces, which, you know, put you across some sort of boundary of disaster. But, you know, these are just different. These are just some different words, right? So these, um, yeah, we can certainly make these highly robust kinds of systems. They're not adaptable. We're in this period now where we're really contending with this. We're trying to make self-organizing things, you know, clever things that are more adaptive, that are a little more biological. Biological systems that we've seen, you know, are often made out of not many parts, fundamentally, um, and, and get away with it. You know, I mean, they're sort of, what is it, ATCG? That's a pretty low level coding system um and uh you know but engineering you know the lego example is not bad actually it's a good fun silly example where we got carried away um but as i said yeah they can become they can move into this complex thing where you know not one person can't really understand it and you have to resort to like even though you made this plane they have to make sort of weird simulations of it and, yeah so that that's uh the the spectacular failure thing um <clears throat> And, and this is a distinction. I, I will talk about complex systems because I'm sort of an insane person. I sort of do include everything in here, like fluids and everything. So, um, but but it is a, it is a it is a difference, of course, um, the, where the system can learn and, and so on. And I would, I mean, in the whole long run of things, and I'll come back to this at points, I suppose. You know, I th I see life. The advent of life is is the start of algorithms, right? That's when algorithms start to take over, and and raw physics is still always around, right? I mean, we have all this data, but, you know, there's energy and all these sorts of constraints because of reality. But, um, uh, you know, the advent of algorithm is this very interesting thing. And there's games, 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 games. And um, you end up with the mass Singer. <laughs> also platypuses. It's not all bad. Okay, so um, this is going to be just a simple thing. So I'll give you a definition, right? So it's a some sort of distributed system that interrelated doesn't have to be network parts um there's no or there's no overriding centralized control right there may be something that's attempting to do that and we may, we like to see that we like to think there's one person in charge of whole systems we love to do that we love to explain things like this um because <clears throat> that's a story it's hard to it's hard to understand systems right and the so, and then emergent behavior. And this is more is different. It's a very famous paper. Um, this is Phil Anderson. Um, and I'll mention him again later on. But uh, uh, it was basically a, a call to arms at the point, at, at, you know, back in time saying, this is in the 70s, saying, actually, you know, if you have the, we, we have quarks or we have atoms or we have, you know, whatever it is, the how people behave and interact with each other, you, you, you can't really go down into the, Right? It doesn't really matter about the quarks. We've got the quarks, right? We're in, there are apparently we're made of quarks. Um, but, you know, you, you have to sort of figure out what the rules of the game are at each level and then figure out how they give emergent behavior at the next step up. And that these are all fundamental sciences. This, the, the important thing, I suppose, is it came from a physicist because the physicist thought they're all doing the most fundamental things. The mathematicians are over here, but uh, everyone else was just doing applied science. Right? It's just applied stuff. Which was wrong. So this is a this is a sort of just a powerful uh, essay back in the time. It appeared in Science in '73, I think. There are other things that can be in there, right? So it's so nonlinear relationships. You know the way things connect. There's feedback loops that often comes, of course, through network structures. Um, people will talk about this. They're open that there's energy being driven into the system. Boundaries are opaque. You don't have to worry about these two things and, and memory. Often you get. But I think the great thing is understanding algorithms. And I know algorithms are used in lots of ways, but I, yeah, yeah. This has been a profound sort of, with all the data we have now, understanding uh, these kind of multi-scale structures that we see everywhere. Um, they're big network systems, but they're often some hierarchical aspect. And yes, so this is this, this is this long run trend. Physical mechanisms, often a lot of randomness. A lot of, you know, randomness is really crucial. We'll see that in this rich get richer thing. And then getting to what I would say is purely algorithmic um, behavior. And this is what, so physicists got into trouble here, I think. They, this blew them up because they want to have equations that govern everything. And, and it gets messier out here, especially in biology. There are all these little gadgets that do things, you know, they just, right. Uh, lots of complex systems, right? 
I mean, this is just basically everything that's interesting. So, you know, how can you wrap your head around all these things? But I mean, yes, lots of things. And then all of these fields are relevant. This is the, sort of the, the problem. Of course, they're fiefdoms and people are stuck in them. Um, and, it's, and it is always a balance. You need people who are absolutely specialists in, in things, someone who studies this one butterfly. We need the whole thing. But I think we, you, can, you get into trouble when you have an imbalance either way, if everyone's a generalist or everyone's a specialist. So, but I'll, I'll give you an argument as to why we can have generalist type people and why everyone should have some at least knowledge of this. This is hard to see, but this is an attempt to... This is complexity science. So lots of people's names in here. This is too hard to read, I suppose. But um, Norbert Wiener, who was somehow at MIT and applied math, but they really wanted to forget about him. But these words like cybernetics, this is this is a bit of a chilling terminology. Uh, but this was all about control and that sort of thing, right? They were trying to figure out how to control systems with the humans inside it. Um, big, you can see, kind of a big, messy business. Hard to read. Okay, so maybe this is a... I don't know, maybe some of you have looked forward on this, but what is, I have a few cryptographs. No, it's not cryptography, but cryptographs, like I have a couple of these. Um, so what is this? <laughs> it's a ridiculous question. Um, so let's see if we can figure out what the axes are, or you know, what, what's going on with the, so it's it's one through 59. So it's it's, what is it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I have some nice stuff on 12. I'll have to show you that. Um, no, it's really, so this is just an integer. This is just a, this is just a, just an integer. So there, so there could be time. That's a good one. No, I mean, really, time is the big thing. Time is the big thing. So that's the first thing to look at. I mean, in existence. Tick, tick, tick. <laughs> What's that? It's not an hour. So it's some other thing. We've got, it's, so what do we say about this? We know it's decreasing, right? It's going down. We've seen some things that do this, right? Where there's integers, one, two, three, four, five. And then what about this axis here? What, is, what could this, so it's, it's zero going down to minus 10. What is it? <laughs> that's um, that's the the walk spoiling axis. Yeah. My youngest brother still lives. He lives near. He lives in the in the town we grew up near. And he runs the whole local hospital there. But he's um. So I'm the weasel in the family. He's uh, there's three boys, and he's a uh, he's like six foot four, two hundred twenty thirty pounds. He's big played professional sports and things, but he, he, um, he lives, he, he lives next to the golf course. And if you're within a kilometer or something in Australia, you're allowed to have your own golf buggy and drive on the roads. So he just, he drives in. It's a pretty good existence. <laughs> he's got a handicap of one or two still. He's pretty, he's good. So, um, no, so it's, what have, we've seen these things. So this is some, this is a very basic thing. This is like this is numbers like one, two, three, like first, second, third, fourth ranks. Okay, so we're ranked. Something's being ranked. This is enough. Well, this will be enough for today. What is down here? This is we're, we're used to these kind of scales now. Many orders of it's a log, so it's a log scale, right? So this is going to be one. This is this is a tenth, a hundred, right? 10 to the minus 10. All right, so this is totally impossible, but I'll tell you what it is. It's, um, it's you, right? So this is the typical fractional weight of atomic species in humans. And so 98% of you is basically six things, which is ridiculous, right? There's a huge scale here. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus. That's most of a human. And then we get out to some of these, uh, uh, some of these are like uranium. These are not good things to have in you, but they're usually trace amounts. So this is, they've got little stars on them. And we, we've only just figured out, um, right? So this is a tough Lego set, 29 kinds of pieces. That's what, that's what we think, there's 29. There were more than 29 in there, but we think we only need 29. 
we only just figured out that bromine is important for, for our existence. So we're, you know, right. I'll say more about atoms on Tuesday, and I know I'm a little bit long. Um, but 10 to the 27 pieces, you dump it out on the floor, one big plastic bag. Give the kids something to do. So like I said, 99% gives you six, six elements. The next five make up you know, a long way towards that next 1%. You need this, right? This will get a little twitchy in the muscles if you don't have magnesium. These are big deal things. Um, people make a lot of money. This, oh yeah, there's um, sulfur, right? This is the evilness factor. So these are necessary trace elements. Um, there aren't many. And so it could be much worse, right? It could be up quarks, down quarks, and, and some electrons. And then, <laughs> and then you can make that if, if, that's, if that's reality. Okay, so... Um, I'll finish. I'll finish talking about the manifesto on Tuesday. But it's pretty weird. You're just a bunch of little atoms. I know people probably told you this in elementary school and high school and whatever, but it is really strange. Really strange. Thank you.